So I don't have such a big stack today, they will improve the box. <laughs> So, someone wrote, thanks to Ajahn Pointers, I managed to reduce the wanderings of my mind on day four and five of the retreat. Thoughts sometimes do occur between my breaths and the thought ceases as I shift my focus back to my breath. Could you give me some pointers or exercises on how I can watch my thoughts? I think this... Uh, Question hopefully got some answers already, both through uh, my explaining and Nampa's explaining how to use this exercise of thinking intentionally, kind of really making thinking obvious in contrast to just silent witnessing. So that's one way, that's one exercise. And otherwise, there's also something interesting as you keep plugging away at the practice and developing it, you notice that. This awareness sometimes can be very sharp and focused on an object, and then sometimes, when we're more in a contemplative mood, the awareness is there, and you can start noticing the mind's gone, and awareness is there anywhere, anyway. We tend to just follow the thought, but as we practice more and more coming back to awareness itself, it's almost like there's a little bit of that that sticks. And we run after the thoughts and we go from thinking of tomorrow, the retreat is ending, and then that connects with what am I going to do afterwards, and then you think of going to do some shopping, and when you think of shopping, you think of calling a friend, doing shop with you and have coffee afterwards, and what you're going to talk about your holidays with them, and then holidays where, maybe in Japan, and then Japan, yeah, the last time I went to Japan, and really that's how thinking works. It's associative. So one thought comes up, and then it overlaps with another, and with another, and with another, and we just kind of, it's like skipping stones, we just go from one to the next. When you develop awareness more and more in the practice, you start noticing that once you catch yourself, you've gone down that path for a, for a bit, you come back to the breath, you're learning to develop a sense of, like, awareness is the refuge. It kind of develops by itself, because that's its nature. And the more and more we kind of come to the knowing of the breath, the breath is the object and it's a useful tool as a reference, but also this awareness becomes kind of where part of us tends to start staying. And then when you re realize the mind's gone off somewhere, you can come back to the breath, and as you're coming back, just before you just settle on that and completely let go of the thinking, sometimes you find yourself, you can retrace the train of thinking. You said, like, I was with the breath, why did I leave? Oh yeah, this came up. Ah, and I went from this to that, and from that to that. And I've been surprised sometimes how many steps, how many jumps in a process of daydreaming and thinking we can actually retrace. And what's interesting about this is that you realize this is just the nature of the mind. When we connect with awareness and we learn to trust it, it remembers, it notices. And you don't have to try to make it do so, but just by cultivating these five factors of concentration, we're strengthening the sense of being with the knowing. And then it does its job, it knows. And you can ask it, and it'll, the information's there. So, partly, there's this exercise Lumpa taught, and I really, really recommend you make use of that, you try it out, anywhere, anytime, on the retreat, at the red light, when you're waiting in line at the cashier, at the shopping mall, or waiting for a friend, before going to bed, when you wake up in the morning, when you're sitting on the toilet, anytime. You can just think one thought and just separated it into its individual bits and notice the gap, the silence, and then the thought, and the silence, and the thought. It's really, really beneficial. But then also trust the process. Like on this meditation retreat, 
by now you've been able to see, it's a process. These are the conditions that are arranged, provided, and if we kind of give ourselves to the conditions, we give ourselves to the schedule, we give ourselves to the noble silence, we give in to the instructions, try to follow them, and it's basically made of recognizing what's going on, letting go and just doing this. You notice that by now, something's changed in the mind. And it's not all the result of having done it, I did it, I did it all myself. It's really noticing, yeah, we had something to do with it. We tried and we tried to guide it and sometimes we got it right, sometimes we got it wrong, but we kept trying and observing and a great part of it is just this process unfolding by itself. So remember the sequence I mentioned that starts with uh, keeping morality precepts that leads to freedom from remorse, which leads to this sense of uh, wholesome happiness and pride, which leads to senerity, and all this sequence that leads all the way to liberation. We don't need to try that hard. The nature of the process is that it'll take us there. So trust. When, when Noam Paul talks about trust awareness, there's just so much to that. And then you will start noticing, thinking. The Buddha teaches us, the knowing is just knowing, it is not a self. Could this also be a view or an opinion that helps us to lighten the dukkha? Well, it's not an opinion, and it's not a view as itself, but it's a point, it's a standpoint from which we learn to look at things, and the, na the nature of a point from which we look is a point of view, there's a view. So the importance is coming back to that point, and that point is learning to look at our experience in terms of the five aggregates, in terms of these four foundations of mindfulness, because that's a way of looking at things that we're relating to them for what they are. And that's a different point of view than when we're back to good old little me, my personality, who I am, what I like and dislike, what I want, don't want. When we come back to that, what we see is one picture that results in quite a bit of discontent and suffering because we get all caught up in desire. When you come back to this different point where you learn to look at the same thing, the same body, the same mind, the same experiences, but from the point of just what it is, it's just the body. What is the nature of the body? It does this stuff. It does health, it does sickness. It does birth, old age and death. What's the nature of the mind? Well, it feels happy, and so, and pain, it remembers stuff, it thinks, it has emotions and moods. So learning to come back to that and look at it in terms of what it is, rather in terms of it being a personality. So it's a point to which we come back to, and the point we come back to, the point the Buddha is guiding us back to, is awareness, because that's where awareness is not personal, but it is. We all are aware, and from this point of view of just awareness of what is arising in consciousness, this is what's arising. The body, the experience of the body is like this, the experience of the mind is like this. And that is a point of view, which we call right view, and it does, it's the Noble Eightfold Path. It's called the way of non-suffering. Mon Paul mentioned that the other day. Yeah? First Noble Truth is there is suffering. Second Noble Truth is the cause. Third Noble Truth is the cessation. And the Fourth Noble Truth is the way of non-suffering. When Mon Paul mentioned consciousness rise and fall, 
And also, consciousness has no beginning and ending. How can it fall if there's no ending? Yes, this can. This is a confusion that can come sometimes. It's a question of language, because sometimes we talk about the five aggregates, and the fifth aggregate is sense consciousness, but sometimes it's just referred to as consciousness. In terms of the way we experience consciousness through the senses is impermanent because the senses are impermanent and the the organ and the object of each sense is impermanent. So the experience of sense consciousness is impermanent, but the consciousness is not. So it's good to know that the distinction between those two. And sometimes when we're just talking, it can be that we use language in a way we use the same word, but in two different contexts. It has a slightly different meaning, used a bit differently. Like Lumpa talks about consciousness being intuitive, like consciousness, awareness, sati sampajanya, the knowing. And sometimes he uses them as being the gate to the deathless, and sometimes he talks about them and he says it's, it is Dhamma itself, so it is the deathless, it's that which is not born and doesn't die. And then sometimes when he's trying to talk about self, explaining what is not self, consciousness is not self. And then he says, but you, that's what you really are, is consciousness. You go, I say, is it not self or is it really me? <laughs> so, realize language has its limitations. And coming back to that first question about how to practice with thinking, recognizing thinking, this exercise that he gives us about learning to recognize thinking by thinking intentionally and then knowing thinking and knowing just awareness, silent awareness, that's witness to both the arising, the ceasing of thoughts, and then the silence in between thoughts, the space in between thoughts. When you do that and you kind of start playing these games, I mean, take something neutral to begin with, just so you start appreciating the difference between just this witnessing, which is silent, and then you can witness noise, the noise of thoughts or whatever it is. And then once you, you can appreciate the difference between the two, and realize thoughts are what they are. And notice the difference between looking at a thought as just a thought, or when you start looking at the content of the thought and you start getting interested in what the thought is about, what's it saying, is it true, or is it not true, do we agree or not, do we like it or not. And then these things like, I'm the best person in the whole world, I'm the worst person in the whole world, or hey, I'm just an ordinary bloke. And you can kind of look at how you relate to that when you're coming back to this witnessing it as a thought, and then it doesn't matter what the thought is telling, talking about. True, false, embarrassing, or not, and that's absolutely no importance. And then when we go and get take an interest in the thought and start looking at what it's about, then we get involved with it and our relationship to it is different. Well, that's the nature of language. And then you notice that these thoughts, they just come up in the mind. A lot of them are just the mind doing what it does. A mind, one of the things it does is think. And sometimes they're useful thoughts and a lot of the time it's just garbage. <clears throat> like the story Lumpa was telling us about sitting for hours during these talks Ajahn Chah would give in the northeastern Thai dialect, couldn't understand anything. The floor was hard and cold and it was late, he was tired, and then he thought, I just, I'm fed up, I can't take this anymore. And ordinarily, if we don't have any perspective on our thoughts, we believe something like that. So sitting here, when we start looking at a little ache or pain in the knee, and I suggest, don't move right away, just watch what the mind is doing, one of the things the mind does is talk, and it tells you, ah, oh, yeah, but what if this pain gets worse? What if I injure my knee? And you learn not to believe everything the mind just kicks up. It's not because it, a thought arises that it's 
important, true, valid, or anything like that. You learn to recognize that. So you recognize thinking is one thing, then reality is another. And then you see how how much we can fool ourselves, delude ourselves by believing language, by believing thoughts. And so many of our misunderstandings amongst each other, just as human beings in a family, amongst friends, let alone between nations, who go to war over slights and things that weren't said properly, misunderstood. It's just language. So it's good to learn to recognize that, because you get yourself out of a world of suffering just by going, ah, yeah, it's just language. This is written small and in pencil. So. For those who have difficulty comprehending conscious awareness and non-self, is it advisable for them to imagine living from an outsider perspective in which I is a temporary union of mind and matter, body, and self is just something, a constructed identity built from conditioning. And the true nature of sentient beings is this outside observer who inherently knows what the I goes through every present moment. I'm asking this as I'm trying to help the older generation understand what the Buddha's teachings are really about, as they mostly understand the ritualistic aspects of Buddhism. Yes, that's a pretty good way of explaining it. But it's also important to realize that this sense of I, even if you're looking at, looking at it from a, as an outsider, kind of to realize this process of identifying as something we create. So this is a, it's a very useful way of looking at it. And I remember when I was, just after I ordained, someone sent me a book of some shaman's teachings from Mexico or something like that. And they were talking about taking the eagle's perspective, because they're very connected, shamans are very connected to nature, and imagining that you're an eagle looking down at yourself. And when you do that, you don't tend to take things so personally. And that was a good exercise for a while, but then I found it was hard work, and I was always projecting myself high up there in the sky and imagining I was an eagle. So you're, create, you're creating a new position that is not actually reality. It is useful, but you're, you're creating something extra. So if you want extra work, go ahead. But what the Buddha's pointing through is like, when he suggests we come back to awareness, so if you find that outside observer useful, by all means use it, but do realize that you're kind of, you're, you have to create that notion of an outside observer looking back. Whereas if you just eventually do come back to this sense of awareness, connect, just connecting with this awareness that's already there, that, like Lung Paul says, isn't born, isn't created, isn't formed, isn't conditioned. It's always here and now. So basically we don't have to look for it. It's here already. We need to learn to just recognize it. And that's part of the practice. Because in that, persp that point of view, that point from which that we come back to, will offer us the same view as this body, which we identify with and think is me, these feelings, these views and opinions and thoughts and moods and all of that. Sense of personality is created out of these building blocks that are basically the five aggregates. <clears throat> Just as we are creative with using different methods of breathing meditation, how can we be creative with walking meditation? For example, walking backwards on pebble stones mindfully. 
Yeah, you can play around with that. That's part of what being creative is. I think if you look at art, any artist who's working on something, they doodle and they sketch and they, they mess around a lot, trying this out, trying that out, seeing what works, what doesn't work, whether it's painting or clay or carving, you name it. They're always kind of playing around with stuff. So you see a lot of, <coughs> in museums, in sculptures and in paintings, you also often see essays. So that's what that is. So part of creativity is to learn to do that, to try something out. But eventually, coming back to just normal walking, Like I only did for a very short period of time this, uh, what they call the Mahasi Sayadaw, the very slow walking, extremely slow, and it develops very good calm, because you're slowing down the body, so the mind eventually slows down as well, and you're kind of breaking everything down into steps and doing it one at a time. But sometimes you do that, and as soon as the meditation period is over, you have to go back to living normally. You can't live slow motion. By the time you get to the, to the dining hall, they've put all the food away. <laughs> you come back to sit, they've gone walking meditation, so you make your way out there, they come back to sit. <laughs> you just can't keep up with anybody. So it's not natural. And Mahasi Sayadaw technique can be good just to try it out, to see what happens if we do something like that. But Lumpur Chao always recommended coming back to just natural, what's, nor what's natural and ordinary. Because then if we learn to develop awareness of ordinary walking, awareness of ordinary sitting, ordinary breathing, then the, we're learning to develop awareness of ordinary things, and then we can take that with us. When we go to the dining hall, when we come back, when we go up to the dorm, tidy stuff up, like everything's so ordinary, and this development of awareness of ordinary postures and activities translates into daily life. So you can start bringing this practice from formal sitting periods and formal walking periods and you start seeing how that translates into just daily life. <coughs> but by all means, be creative and sort of look at if anything helps kind of clarify that sense of awareness of walking. Try it out for a bit, but come back to what's ordinary and see how it applies to just natural walking back and forth. So this is a, either two questions or two parts. Before a person reaches any jhanas, can he bring forward any of his increased practice of concentration to his next human life, assuming the person has never reached jhana before? And the second part, when is it a good time? Okay, so the second part I'll take after. I don't know, because I don't remember my past lives, so I don't know what I brought in from it. And... Um, Well, this is a good example of what happens when you think of jhanas. There are jhanas in the suttas, and, and jhanas are spoken about, especially in meditation circles, maybe even more so in retreats, because the environment sometimes is a little bit more conducive for that. So those who are able or prone to those kind of experiences talk about them. And then I've met people who come to monasteries and say, oh yeah, I've, I've got jhanas. And what am I supposed to say? Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> or they've been, to, they've been to monasteries where they got a certificate for second jhana, and some of them got a certificate that they're sodapanas or sakyaragamis. What do you do with something like that? Because it just, it just becomes another way of 
identifying with something. I'm someone special, I got jhanas, what do you have? <laughs> you have anything special? Psychic powers? <laughs> And then it becomes a competition and we're back into kind of ego trips and, and who's better, who's not so good, who's further down along the way, who's lagging. And that's not what the practice is about. The practice is about understanding personality, understanding how we create a sense of self and how that is a source of suffering. So. It, it's always good to kind of leave jhanas alone, they are what they are. But notice what happens, or if you want to think about them and, and try to get them, do it mindfully. Go down that road and be honest with yourself, and look what happens. Look at how much desire is involved. Look at how much thinking and imagining is involved. And be honest, do you actually know, do you know, in your experience, in your heart, what a jhana is? And most people don't, but they create an image of what a jhana might be. And you can only create an image from your own experiences. And you haven't experienced jhana. So you have experienced a bunch of stuff, and out of that you create an image of what jhana might be. And then when you make efforts and you strive, you're striving to try to reach that image, which has nothing to do with jhana, it has to do with your experiences and your memories. There's no way you're going to reach jhana pursuing an image you created from your own experiences or from what you heard other people say. <clears throat> That's not how it works. But if you want to try, by all means try, but then look at what's happening and really look at the reality of what's happening when you're trying to go after a jhana. I've got a very good friend who ordained as a monk he was a very happy, very happy guy, always smiling. He was kind of, in a way, he was kind of the opposite of me, because I've got a condition which made me prone to be very self-negative and very self-critical. And so he'd come and say, Hey, Asoko, can you believe how much barami we have? And I'm like, oh, what are you going on about? <laughs> Basically, what I saw is that he was happy, but Barami, no. And so, as much as he kind of was into it, I was kind of, my conditioning kind of took me the other way. And, uh, but anyway, he had all this joviality and this happiness and stuff, and he had been listening to teachings about jhana. One teacher in particular who kept talking about jhanas and jhanas and jhanas, and Sotapanna and Aryapugala, and it's all very inspiring stuff. And so he'd listened to these teachings on tape, and he'd kind of gone and met the teacher, and done a retreat with him, and decided, I'm going to ordain and get this stuff. And so we ordain, and he always seems to be very, very into meditation, into practice. And I'm like, I wish I had that kind of, that kind of uh, determination, because sometimes I do, and sometimes I just don't. So it's quite admi admiring of him. And then we kept getting sent different places at different times, so we'd meet shortly and then he'd go off, then he'd come back and I'd be sent off. So I never spent much time with him until our fourth Vasas. We were at Watnana Chat, and I'm like, finally I get to spend some time with my friend and get to know him better. Where is he at after five years in robes? Because we do one year as a novice training and then monastic training, monks training. And as I spend time with him, I realize something's changed. And so I talk with him and try to understand what changed, and basically he's slacked off, big time. So what's happened? Ah, you know. And I didn't know any of this. So he had, he basically told me, he ordained, and he had created this notion in his mind that he was going to ordain, and as a novice, first pansa at the latest, he'd have his first jhana, and then quickly move on to the fourth jhana, and then sotapanna, like that, and on to the goal. And he told me that by the end of his first vasa, 
he felt completely discouraged because no matter how many hours he put into it, no matter how, no matter how much he tried, how many talks he listened to, how much inspiration he tried to pump into the system, there was no jhana in sight, not even a shadow of a jhana. So by then, by the time we finish our first vasa, we spent about two years in the monastery. It's a long time. And so he kind of kept going on, kind of half motivated, but wondering if this was going to happen or not. And by the time our fourth vasa was coming around and we were talking, kind of it wasn't in it anymore. And I was a bit concerned and I was saying, so, but if this was your reason for ordaining, does that mean you're thinking of disrobing? And he says, I don't know, what am I going to do anyway if I disrobe? And I just laughed and I said, what they all do, either become a meditation teacher or a psychotherapist. <laughs> and he went, you just did it, I'm going to become a psychotherapist. <laughs> and he did. And I believe he's a very good one too. But that was a really, really interesting thing to see, because that's what happens when we kind of grasp an ideal so tightly. That's all we want, and we don't actually necessarily come in touch with what is happening. And there's so much happening in monastic life. There's so much happening in meditation, in practice, in investigation of Dhamma, of the body, of the mind outside of jhanas. There's plenty of material there. So, like when Lumpo Sumedho went to ask Ajahn Chah about the jhanas, he just said, leave them alone, just practice the jhana factors, which are basically those five factors of concentration. Because you're, then you're working on the causes, and leave the results to whenever they are supposed to come. We're not in control of that. It's like Ajahn Chah being from northeast Thailand and farmer communities, a lot of very down to earth similes, so he compared it to planting a chili tree, a little chili plant. You plant the thing and then for a while it's underground, but you keep watering it and you trust that even though you don't see the seed underground and you don't see it sprouting. You just wait, you do what you need to do. Eventually something breaks through the surface of the earth and hurrah, it's alive. And you keep watering it and you make sure it gets plenty of sun, but you try to protect it from the bugs. So basically you protect it from what's going to harm it and you give it the conditions it needs to keep growing and then trust the process. Just keep providing the causes, the results will come on their own because that's the nature of the process, is the nature of the chili plant. If every time you wonder, how long is this going to take, and you pull it out of the earth to check out the roots, and then you put it down, the poor thing is getting traumatized, pulled out of it, it's separated from the things that are nourishing it. And so, if we obsess too much with the chilies, and we start fussing around too much, and we don't learn to trust the process, and we forget to just look after the causes and conditions that allow this process to develop and grow and mature, we're never going to get chilies. And so with jhanas, a lot of teachers, and Nampo Sumero in particular, really encourages us to just leave them alone, work on the causes of concentration, and trust that the process will bring about just enough samadhi to contemplate Dhamma and realize suffering and the end of suffering. The second part of the question is, when is it a good time for a practitioner to change teachers or system if things are not working out, no improvement, etc.? And that's a difficult question to answer, because there is no fast reply to that. Because the nature of the practice is that sometimes we can uh, spend a lot of time with the perception of no improvement. doesn't mean there isn't any. It just means we're not noticing it.
the Buddha, the Buddha used the simile of a carpenter who finishes his training, and upon completing his training, just when he starts working, he's gifted a brand new hammer. And he uses that hammer every day. And as time goes by, the handle of the wooden handle of the hammer starts taking this patina of use. You start looking smooth, and sort of all the sweat from the hand starts changing the color of the wood. And then as time goes by, as years go by, you can really see this hammer has been really used a lot. But there's not a single day when the carpenter uses this hammer where he can say, ah, this is the day that it changed. It's something that happens very gently, very slowly, very progressively. So on the short term, you don't notice change. On the longer term, you're able to appreciate change. So with the practice, we need to be patient and give it time in order to see what's happening. So that's an important aspect of it. And then we do all have different characters and tendencies and we need to learn how what those are in the practice and what kind of practice speaks to us, which one doesn't. For example, I grew up with my, uh, my mother was into Tibetan Buddhism and I liked all the, I liked it all. I mean, I, she put a, a poster, an image of a tanka of Chinretsik, who is the Tibetan equivalent of uh, Guan Yin. So she was sitting there on this lotus pad with a disc of the moon, sitting cross-legged, and she was represented as a female body and had these four arms holding, holding a gem and the two arms here, and then a mala beads, a rosary in one hand and a lotus flower in the other, and a lot of blue tones in the color. Then I grew up throughout my primary school years and first year of uh, high school, I was always looking at that Im image above my desk. It was a very beautiful image. And sometimes I'd do Hom Padmi Hum, and then I learned a longer mantra. It's about that long. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a mantra of, that's supposed to be for purification, and uh, you're supposed to recite it 21 times every day to purify the mind. So I never did it 25 times a day, every day, for a long period of time, but every now and again I'd pick it up. And it was interesting to notice, retrospectively really, more than on, on the moment, but I would notice that I tend to pick it up and recite it when I was running into some sort of difficulties or suffering. And some, something intuitive inside kind of connected with it and I'd start reciting it and reciting it 21 times took some, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes, something like that. And if you're going to apply your mind, like if you're suffering about anything at all, it involves thinking and remembering and emotions and all of that, and you get caught up in this. And then for 20 minutes, you put that down, and you go and repeat it again and again. So basically you're taking attention away from all this package which is unpleasant, and you're putting it on something that at, at the minimum is harmless. It's neutral. And so you're letting go of suffering by putting attention on something else. And then it kind of gives a sense of focus. So I didn't understand any of this, but this is what was going on. And the heart knows, and it kind of connects with stuff. But it never really went much further than that, because I'd see my mom kind of studying Tibetan, learning Tibetan letters and language, and she saw that I was kind of looking over her shoulder, so she gave me some material. And I started looking at it, and I was like, ah, School is enough already. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of, it seemed like so much more studying and somehow I didn't connect with that. And trying to visualize, like with them, they use these tankas, these images that are very detailed as meditation objects. My mind doesn't do that. It, it does a lot of images, but to stay with an image is not something it does very, very well. And it's only when I, by good fortune, ended up visiting Amravati as a teenager. And on my first day there, Long Pao was doing a guided meditation in the early afternoon before a period of work. And it's just, this is how you sit, cross your legs, full lotus if you can, half lotus, or just cross your legs, or sit whatever way you're comfortable. 
have a little something under your backside to prop up the pelvis because we tend to be Westerners tend to be stiff. So if we sit on the floor, our knees are up there, our backs are hunched, <laughs> and it's a tough position to hold for any length of time. So he was teaching how to just establish the posture, how to sit up in a way where you sit up straight, but you're not kind of ramrod straight and too tense. Leave the hands just sitting there loosely in your lap. And then just do a body scan and he'd guide us to a very simple body scan. It took about three minutes, but just going of noticing how the head feels, the top of the head, the forehead, the eyebrows and the eyelids, and your cheeks and your lips, and then coming down the neck to the shoulders, the arms, elbows and hands, and just feeling the hands sitting in your lap, and then the chest, the abdomen, the sensation of pelvis, the sitting bones in contact with the sitting cushion or the chair, and then just noticing what the legs feel like, thighs, knees. So I'm, I'm going through it a bit faster, but he basically guided us through that. So basically you're kind of coming back to the body a little bit, reining it in gently, and then how to watch the breath. Notice the in-breath and then the out-breath. And then he gave us this little exercise of counting, counting till five. One in, one out, two in, two out. Try to reach five, but be, be very, very strict with yourself. You have to be with every moment of the in-breath and every moment of the out-breath. And when the out-breath ends, you stay with that until the next in-breath starts. And as soon as your mind wavers a bit, start again. And that was it. And so here I sat. And I was like, just that, coming back to the body, connecting with the breath, having a sense of, having a sense of challenging oneself in a way, kind of staying with the breath. And then the next day he talked about the hindrances. When you see how difficult it is to stay with the breath, what is preventing us from successfully going one, two, three, four, five, and staying with it is because the mind keeps getting disturbed. And these disturbances basically come into these five groups, these hindrances. And that just clicked for me. And then I was there for three weeks, and the last ten days of my three-week stay at the monastery coincided with a time when Ajahn Suchito was teaching a silent retreat. And the lady who was running the retreat center kind of snuck me and my friend onto the retreat. And by the end of that, I was kind of, I was sold. Because it connected. And it connected in a way that kind of Tibetan Buddhism didn't click for me. And it's not saying that one is better or the other, it's just whatever our kama is, our conditioning, our tastes and preferences. It's like the story of a monk who ordained with uh, um, Sariputta. And Sariputta tried teaching him an apanasati and the guy just didn't get it. And Sariputta was at wit's end. He's like, this monk cannot be taught. So he took him to the Buddha and said, can't teach this one. And the Buddha said, yes, he can be taught. You just have to know how. And the Buddha, kind of with his psychic powers, produced the image of a golden flower growing, budding, blossoming, and then wilting and falling apart until it was dried and fell back to the floor. And the monk just like that fell into concentration and the Buddha just taught him a few words of Dhamma and he was good. <laughs> the reason that worked for him is because he had spent lifetimes, apparently, obsessing as a goldsmith trying to produce the perfect rose made of gold leaf and trying to reproduce the thickness of the rose petals and everything, and roses that have a lot of many layers, is an incredibly difficult, difficult thing to do. And at the end of a, a lifetime, he still wasn't satisfy, satisfied. Body's old, it dies, and, but his obsession and his attachment to this project is so strong that he gets reborn as a human being in a family that uh, leads him to being a goldsmith all over again. And he does that again and again. And he, for lifetimes, he obsessed with the flower 
of gold. And the Buddha was able to pick up on this, so he made this golden colored flower and used it to show him arising and ceasing. And the penny dropped. So we don't necessarily have the barami of these people where we meet the Buddha and he just goes, Shazam, <laughs> and we're good. But we can still look and, and find our way. So try one tradition, try one teacher, see what he has to say, apply the teachings, try it out. And you'll get some benefit because there's always something in it. But then if you're not sure, you can try something else and also look at what suits your character, look at what sort of speaks to your heart. But when you find something that speaks to your heart, then stick with it. Because the danger of going shopping around too much is that you end up going nowhere at all. When I was 19, 20 years old there in Watnana Chat, I remember one gentleman, I think he was an, an American from New York or something like that. He was in his mid-sixties and he came by Watnana Chat and stayed for a month and he had all these stories about all these different teachers and monasteries and he, he knew everything and he was going to ordain. And his plan to ordain was already 40 years old and he was still looking for the perfect place and the perfect teacher and he was 65 years old. So that's what happens when we kind of go shopping around too much. How do I decide if an act is wholesome or not when in structures where there is a mix of benefit and harm to others? Now that's the nature of karmic actions that we create by body and speech and mind. It's like the Buddha described, there's wholesome kamma, then there's unwholesome kamma, and then there's mixed kamma. And we have to learn how to navigate that. That's what the Eightfold Path is about. So the Eightfold Path, these eight factors that are separated into these three groups, so right view, right intention, or what they call the wisdom group. Then right speech, right action, right livelihood is the morality group. And then right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration are the concentration group, the samadhi group. They work together. And so we have to learn to understand that. And the Buddha gives us these guidelines. He talks about the five precepts. So we can take those and start contemplating that and starting to start to learn to recognize cause and effect for ourselves. But then also kind of remembering what he taught his son, Rahula, investigate. Investigate for yourself. Try to anticipate. If you can't anticipate because you're not sure, well then try it out and while you're doing it, try to evaluate where this is heading. And if you're not sure, or maybe you haven't thought of it and it's done, then you can review. Remember what you said, what you did, and look at whether the results are beneficial or not. And if you see that it's a mixed bag, it's your sila. You're the one who has to live with the results of it. Kama, like in the question, is like whether there's benefit and harm to others. It's never just others, it's always ourselves as well. There's nothing we can do or say that doesn't affect us as well. We can say, no, it's purely for others. And yet we're the one doing it, and we're the one who has to live with the memory of having done something purely for others. So that's the bit that's not purely for others. It's also how our own actions affect ourselves. So that's how we learn to evaluate benefit and harm and what we're willing to live with. And if we're interested in developing the path and understanding that, understanding suffering and how to avoid suffering, because we're sensitive to that, so to have a, out of compassion for ourselves and out of compassion for others, how can we address the situation which, if we act a certain way, results in a mixed bag of benefit and harm, how can we navigate this in a way that there's less harm, more benefit, or no harm and just benefit? 
But then there's always that little uh, aspect of it where, like Lumpo Cha was saying in the practice, there is suffering. That's the name, that's the first noble truth. But there's some types of suffering that lead to the end of suffering, and there's some type of suffering that leads to more suffering. So when you think of a little a mother and her young child, if the child is going to put something in their mouth and it's heading down their throat and it's something they're going to choke on, the parent thinks of the long-term benefit of the child. The short-term benefit is they've got to open that mouth, put a finger in there and get it out, and the baby is going to hate that. So short-term seems harmful, but it's actually not harmful, it's really beneficial. So that would be the kind of suffering that leads to freedom from suffering. And so learn, learn to recognize these things. So when, when we see that something is going to be a mixed bag, what kind of mixed bag is it? And really learn to investigate, really use, develop investigation to understand. Okay, so this one is about jhanas again. I think we've said enough about that. <laughs> is there a sutta that Buddha specifically teaches or talks about the knower or consciousness or awareness? There are a couple of places in the suttas, but most of the time when he talks about the path is very often about the things that we tend to grasp and that we need to let go of. And when he, t when he talks about... Uh, people ask him about Nibbana, he always talks about Nibbana in terms of what it's not, which is really interesting. Because that's an, uh, on one hand, that's the nature of knowing. It knows Sankaras, but it's n it is never the Sankara that it knows. And it's very. It's because this the nature of awareness of consciousness of this knowing is such that it can know itself. Like when we ask you, "Are you conscious?" You go, "Yes, I am." So you've checked, and you're able to do that. And yet, consciousness is not something that you can objectify. If you try to objectify it, you're using thinking. And so, thought becomes the object of awareness. And because we're so addicted out of our ignorant habits, we're so addicted to sankharas and don't notice the awareness part of experiencing sankharas, our habit is to go out to that. So imagine if the Buddha did say, well, Nibbana is like this and like that and like the other, then we'd end up like the same problem as with the jhanas. We start creating an image of what it is and an image is a sankhara, it's created, and then we're chasing a sankhara again. So there's no way we're going to chase a sankhara and end up coming back to pure awareness. And yet there are a couple of places in the suttas. One that I know of is one that Lumpur used a lot to reflect. Vinyanang anidasanang anantang sapato papang, where the Buddha says, there is this consciousness that is boundless, luminous, unlimited, and without an object. But it's very few, there are very few of those in the, in the whole suttas. But he does talk about it. Where it is, I'm not capable of telling you. I'm not, I'm not that kind of scholar who remembers the places in the suttas, so please forgive me. What is the difference between investigating and thinking? So I think this we addressed a little bit earlier in the, in the retreat. So I hope that point is covered. But just for a reminder, like remember those three levels of what the Buddha talks these, about, these three levels of wisdom, the language level, the teachings, the wise teachings, which we can hear, read, and then memorize. And then the second level is using... Once we've memorized it, well, then it becomes thinking, doesn't it? 
So we think about the teachings and we use that as something that we can use to compare with our experience and try to understand how does what he, the Buddha talk about, how does that relate to what we're experiencing. So that's the second level of bringing, bringing it in. And then the third level is this kind of this reflecting, but not reflecting in the sense of thinking, more in the sense of looking, of witnessing, in the silence of the mind. In the silence, the knowing is there. So that's the difference between investigating and thinking. Investigating is the whole range. We can use the thinking, we can use it to come as pointers to come back here, and then investigating just in the sense of looking. Like when, you, when you're in your tent and you've unpacked everything, stuff is all over the place and you're looking for one little object. You know what you're looking for and you start pushing things around, lifting, moving, unpacking one bag, repacking it, and then you find yourself thinking, where is the damn thing? <laughs> That's a thought. But when you're looking, you're not thinking, you're looking. That's also investigating. So that applies to the mind as well. Could you please explain where in, where in consciousness, how to be aware of it? What is the difference between Vijnana and awareness. Okay, so I think that's covered. Talked about it earlier, yeah? The difference between sense consciousness and pure consciousness. So Vijnana, that Pali term, can be used sometimes as a short, like in the Pali chanting, when they say the five khandhas, the fifth one is Vijnana, that refers to sense consciousness. And yet the Buddha uses the same term, Vijnana, when he goes, when it's this kind of, there is a consciousness that is pure, luminous, unbounded, without an object. Last night, the mind was alert, could not sleep the whole night. What do you recommend in such a situation? bliss out, enjoy it. <laughs> it's interesting to notice that, like, I don't know if this is what uh, the person who wrote this question experienced or not, but when I started experiencing that, it kind of threw me off because at night it's meant for sleeping. And my notion of kind of leading a health, healthy life and feeling good means at night you have to sleep, so the next morning you feel refreshed. So the first time that happened to me, to me, I felt really disturbed. And I was kind of fretting all night, thinking that the next morning I was really going to be a zombie all day. But then when, it, when I reflected back on it, I realized actually what's happening here is the mind is bright. The nature of meditation is such that we learn to let go of things. And we let go of a lot of the things that are actually exhausting. Thinking is a creative process, it's work, it uses energy. Remembering is the same. And then we think and we remember and all these emotions come up and some of them are nice and we want more of them, that's more work. Some of them are unpleasant and we resist them, that's more work. We try to get rid of them, that's even more work. It's all work. It's tiring. Emotions are exhausting if that's the way we relate to them. So in practice, when we're sitting here for hours and days and we're practicing letting go for the sake of just coming back to the breath, using that as a reference, and then just letting go of stuff. We're establishing awareness, we're awake, attention is there, interested and bright, and we're letting go of a lot of things that would otherwise tire us. So when meditation start bearing fruit and the energy cultivated in this process starts kind of accumulating, then the evening comes, the night comes, and you're not tired you still feel fresh. And so I had to kind of remind myself of that and recognize that and say, oh, actually, this is something to rejoice in. This is something to enjoy. And so then I 
try sitting some more, walking some more. Eventually you get tired and you go and catch some sleep, but it might just be two or four hours. And you wake up the next morning, watch what happens, and you go, huh, I actually feel okay. It's amazing stuff, this practice, what it does. Or you can just lie there, but if the mind is bright and awake, bright and awake, then you lie down and it's not doesn't want to sleep. So just watch the breath and keep enjoying practice, staying with the breath, just watching what happens if you lie down and sleep doesn't come. What's that like? So remember, it's uh, it's the result of all this good work we've been doing, all this cultivation is very good actually and so don't be afraid of it it's a sign that the, the mind is kind of letting go of stuff and then not getting so burdened it's like walking with a heavy backpack is tiring so we need to rest often and we need to take breaks but when you lighten the load it's easier to keep going for longer so that's what's happening so that's something to rejoice in. Could you clarify why does the third Satipatthana state knowing an angry mind as an angry mind and a not angry mind as a non-angry mind, etc.? Not judging if anger is good or bad, but in right effort of the Eightfold Path, we have to prevent the arising of unwholesome or abandon any unwholesome actions or speech that has already arisen. In the practice, do we practice in accordance with the third satipatthana or right effort regarding anger or lust, etc.? If you remember, what is it, yesterday I think, there was this question about this random nasty thought popping up in the mind during meditation that was not intentionally thought is that bad karma and really realizing how thinking the process of thinking is uh, is vipaka karma a lot of the time it just goes on on its own thinking arises on its own often as a result of the energy we put into it in the past and so it's the same with anger with lust. If we, if whenever we're displeased with something, we give in to that displeasure and manifest it and speak on it and act, act on it, we're allowing this kind of anger to slowly grow and it gets stronger and stronger and we feel really self-righteous. And then because we feel self-righteous, it feels right to get angry and it becomes more and more. And we cultivate a habit of nourishing this anger. And the habit just comes easier and easier. So the triggers need to be less and less for the same amount of anger to arise. And so in the process of abandoning it, abandoning that which has already arisen, so anger arises, when anger arises on its own, it's vipaka, it's vipaka kama, it's the result of some past action. It has an energy of its own. The habit is that when I don't get what I want, I throw a tantrum, I get angry, I blame somebody, I swear. So if I do that every time I don't get what I want, well, I think we've all seen children who do that. We call them spoiled brats. <laughs> Basically, there's no one putting a check to that, and so they allow this to kind of run course, and then sometimes ang ang anger can be an intimidating energy. When people get angry, it can be scary. And so some people develop a habit, develop a habit of getting their ways by getting angry because it scares people, and people would rather give in to it and sort of pacify you by giving you what you want rather than just saying, sorry, no can do and be willing to let the anger kind of exhaust itself. So when anger arises, very often we don't go and look for it. 
I, I don't know anybody who kind of gets angry for the fun of it or because they're bored, they just get angry about something. It's a reaction that arises and that's conditioned. So in terms of the third Satipatthana, when the Buddha is talking about recognizing a mind with anger as a mind with anger, a mind free from anger as a mind free from anger, he's talking about when this process is happening. And the th right effort comes into play in terms of when anger arises, it's just doing its job. The causes and conditions for anger to arise are present and anger arises. Then right effort here is not to act on it, not to speak on it. That's abandoning it. It doesn't mean we get rid of it. It means you recognize it is what it is. I'm not going to touch that one, get in trouble if I do. And so it's practicing restraint, practicing staying here, keeping our mouths closed, going away if we need to, or otherwise just staying there and just waiting until it passes. That's right effort. And as we do that, we watch. We watch that whole process happening and we realize the difference in experience, the difference in the, what's happening when we follow the anger, what are the results, and when we refrain from following the anger, then what happens? And that's when you start realizing that anger causes and conditions, part of the causes and conditions for anger to arise is that we follow it or we try to repress it. That also doesn't work. Because when we try to repress it, the causes and conditions for anger to arise are already there. Anger needs to arise and it needs to arise in consciousness. It's through arising in consciousness that it gets to arise and cease. So if our position is a position of restraint, coming back to a position of safety, behind the guidelines of the precepts, and then we just watch that, then we realize actually it passes, no harm was done. That awareness, we can feel anger, we, and we feel it in the body. We feel hot, we feel restless, we may, it feels much more dense as an emotion. And then while anger is there, notice that thoughts arise. Yeah, but he, she did or didn't, and I'm right, they're wrong, and all that. So the thinking also is conditioned by the anger. And then we just let the thoughts do what they do. So that's how anger manifests as an emotion, as sensations in the body, as feelings, as thoughts, maybe as memories. He did it again. <laughs> but just watch it. That's the whole show of the five aggregates kind of unfolding, conditioned by anger. Let it happen, watch it, and then let it cease. And then you realize, this is what anger is like. And then when it has ceased, this is what it's like. So that's the third Satipatthana, getting to know this is impermanent, it comes and it goes. And once it's gone, it's gone. All the urgency, all the self-righteousness, everything that came with it, all the sensations in the body, they just vanish. It's a memory now. So you realize anger is, is that. It's not self, it's just anger arising and ceasing. So you're developing understanding, wisdom, relating to it and learning to recognize impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and not-self. And the right effort helps you come back to that position of the knower. It guides us. I think I experienced the silence just now. I was preparing to just... something. <laughs> Sorry, I can't read this. Just what? Relax, not meditate. And suddenly, I experienced, I experienced it. 
loud silence, bright mind, wow. Sorry, I need my glasses. And then the commentary came in from the thinking mind, and it was gone. Why does this thinking mind do that? And how do we practice so that it doesn't do that? <laughs> it's not nice, is it? <laughs> Sometimes when I used to get frustrated with situations, I'd tell Lompa, why does somebody do that, or why does something have to happen? And he'd just chuckle and said, the Buddha never asked why. <laughs> and in the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha doesn't say anything else that it's like this, there is suffering. So. I mean, why does the mind do that? Because that's what the mind does, it thinks. And if it's the first time that we experience that, well, of course we're going to get excited. And when we get excited, we start jumping up and down and thinking, and wow! <laughs> so that's a natural response. And then we want to get it again. That's also natural. I remember when that period of time I was telling you about when I was in this uh, jungle with Ajahn Pasano near the Burmese border. I was having this period of extraordinarily good, pleasant states of mind, and one day something happened and I went to find him at his little platform and I said, Ajahn, I experienced this. And he said, very good, very good. Now be careful. You're going to want it again. And you need to remember to focus on the causes, not on the result. So what did I do? I went back and obsessed with the result. <laughs> because that's what we do. <laughs> and I remembered it and for 10 years, and then when I came back and reordained, as I was telling you, I tried to kind of come back to that memory. Eventually you realize it's a memory. So, But the interesting thing about this is that it is insight. It's insight into how the work, how the word, how the mind works. What you experienced here when the mind just went silent, it's also interesting to note that you were practicing and then you just relaxed. And very often that's when things happen. Because when we're trying, we're kind of focusing, and oftentimes we don't have the kind of wide open, wide open view. We're trying, so we're following a track, and we're trying this and that and the other, and so we we f narrow the focus to what we're doing, anapanasati, and all of this. And yet, it's only when we relax and we let go that we open up, and we can actually see what the result of all this effort is. Sometimes when we're making efforts, we're still focused on the effort. So the effort is necessary because that's what leads to the result. But sometimes it's just when we stop and relax that we finally realize, oh, hang on, look at this. And we kind of appreciate where it's at. But the effort and what we did was what led to this state. And that's very important to remember. So, using reflection, using investigation here, would be, okay, well, what were the instructions? What, what, what was I doing? And how did I set up my mind? And try to understand what the causes and conditions were. And understand that, basically, it's the practice, it is the effort, it was that, that led there. So, if you want to experience that again, the memory is fine. It's a memory now. But we need to cultivate the insight. So it was an insight, but insights just on their own become memories. And if you don't do anything else about it, then that's all they will remain as a memory. So we need to cultivate the insight, meaning look at it, remember it. That third option when the Buddha was talking to his son Rahula, when you did something, review it and look, was it beneficial or not? Did it have beneficial results or not? And if yes, enjoy the results of that. But then also 
that's something that's safe, you can do that again. What led there? Back to those four idipadas, the four factors of success. Aspiration, energy, setting one mind, setting one's mind on it, being determined, and then reviewing. So you can see how these teachings of the Buddha, they keep crisscrossing each other and kind of coming back to each other. They're really part of a whole. So when this happens, and you go, wow, and the moment the thinking kicks in, well, it's ended. That's the way it is. You go, oh, okay. So then in the practice, you kind of go back to the same efforts, the same routine, the same exercises you were doing, because those were the causes of that state of mind. But you start realizing that state of mind was not thinking. The thinking barged in and disturbed the image. So basically it's about silence. It's about relaxing. So now when you're practicing, coming back to the breath, practicing restraint with your speech, basically trying to cultivate these conditions that lead to this, you're starting to give importance to the silence because you realize this was silent. So how do I connect? How do I learn to value that silence? How do I learn to abide in the silence? Thinking still does its thing. Oh, hang on. Nampo Anajana Soko kept talking about that exercise about thinking intentionally, noticing the thought and then the silence. And so you start paying attention to silence, you start valuing silence, you start learning how to abide in silence. So reflecting like this and using that experience to develop understanding and to guide your efforts. Okay, this one I already addressed the other day. How does one maintain conscious awareness without losing oneself in the conversation or speaking? Do we maintain awareness of the body points during conversations? Yeah, look at what happens. Look at what happens when we talk a lot. We tend to completely lose our connection with this sense of awareness. And then we, if we really talk a lot and we try to come back to it, we've just really agitated everything up there. Talking a lot leads to a lot of memories. So you leave a conversation and all that stuff is echoing inside. So just notice that dynamic. So if you're looking for that connection with awareness, talking a lot doesn't help. So we start reducing the amount we talk. So we're paying attention to how speech and conversations affect that connection with awareness. And then as we develop awareness of the body here, you notice how just allowing the mind to go scatter itself all over the place makes it difficult then to come back to the body. And so you learn the value of this sense of restraint. We're interested, we want to go to a ton of places out there, let the mind go out to all these interesting things. So they're fun and interesting, and yet if I follow that, then I'll have a hard time coming back to, the, to this. And so we learn to kind of see that, recognize that, and naturally our priorities will change. And then sometimes you really, really want to do something, so you do it. And then when you come back, then you have to be patient with the process so that all that energy going out exhausts itself and starts settling back down again. So noting how conversations, how talking affects this, what we talk about. Like when we talk about Dhamma and about practice, like now, I'm always kind of and I, I, if I don't want to just answer the questions from an intellectual point of view, I'm referring back to experience. So it's always coming back to that. And so talking about Dhamma is much more beneficial than talking about other stuff because it, bring, it tends to bring the mind back like this. 
try it out, have conversations about Dhamma and just look at how it affects the mind. And then in the same way that we're here and we cultivate this kind of awareness of the body, the breath, here and now, and then you go to lunch, and then you come back and have a bit of a rest, tidy up the tent a little bit, rest for a bit, and then get up, go to the bathroom, stretch a bit, and then come back for the afternoon sitting. You get to notice that if you do all of that and completely let go of awareness, by the time you come back to sit down, it takes a while to reconnect with it, because you've just abandoned it. If you do that and regularly check back in, so you've been sitting, it's like this, and so by keeping noble silence when we go for lunch and then come back, go back to the dorm, to the tent, if we keep noble silence, you realize, okay, this is really helpful. And yet you can still distract yourself. It doesn't have to be speech and conversation. You can get me just looking out at the view or wondering why somebody did something or didn't do something or whatever it is. And notice how if we just let the mind go with that, then it has to come back as well. And in conversations it's the same thing. So long conversations tend to draw us further. Shorter conversations tend to, maybe they draw us out, but it's easier to come back. And then during conversations you realize, well, if I'm the one doing all the talking, there's more of that, or if it's a conversation and I kind of, I like this sense of awareness here, so how about I talk a bit less and let the other person do some talking? And then when you're listening, it's easier to listen from here. And so explore that. So rather than me giving you an answer to how this works, what I'm trying to do is encourage you to investigate and understand this process by yourself. And then it is just past nine o'clock, but it's the last question too, so I'll take it. Assuming a person is very tired, he has to make choices, he has four hours, does he sleep for two hours and meditate for two hours? Does he drink stimulants like caffeine and meditate for four hours? <laughs> or is there another solution? What do I advise? <laughs> uh, this is very good uh, terrain for exploration. What I advise is you try it out and see what works best for you. <laughs> because I can't tell you. I don't know how very tired it is and what has to happen after four hours. So that also dictates whether it might be you have maybe you have to sleep for four hours, keep meditation for another time, or maybe you can do both. Basically, you need to know, you need to learn to understand the circumstances that you're working with, learn to understand how the mind works, and learn to navigate those waters. So we're back to this factor of enlightenment, investigation, what works and what doesn't work. And don't be afraid to try it out, and if it doesn't work, it's just, oh, okay, this didn't work. It doesn't have to be, I'm a failure. It can just be, oh, look, this didn't work, okay, how about trying something else? No more questions. <laughs> <laughs>